In the early hours of the 3rd of November 2013, the body of 10-year-old Imani Moss was discovered by police, discarded in a bin outside her parents' home. The investigation that followed revealed the extensive abuse Imani faced at the hands of her stepmother in what one lawyer dubbed a case of Cinderella gone horribly wrong. Overlooked in favour of her siblings, Imani was locked in her bedroom to starve to death alone. This is the tragic case of Imani Moss. So excited because I have partnered with one of my favorite gaming apps, Huge Casino. So this app is amazing, it's a game changer because anyone who loves the thrill of casino games but doesn't like the risk associated will totally love this app because it's completely free to download, it's risk free and it's available on both iOS and Android devices. When you first join Huge Casino, you're welcomed with a pretty massive bonus, 5 million chips. Yeah, you heard that right. Five million. This generous star obviously allows you to explore a variety of games right off the bat. And speaking of games, there are over 100 to choose from. Whether you're a fan of the classic slot machines or you prefer modern slots, this app has it all. The games are inspired by real casino slots, which gives you an authentic experience right from your phone. But it's not just about the slots. Huge Casino also offers a range of table games like poker, roulette, baccarat, and blackjack. It's like having a risk-free mini casino in your pocket available anytime you want to play. One of the coolest features of Huge Casino is the social aspect. So you can join a club to team up with friends or you can make new ones from around the world. And if you happen to be competitive, you will love competing in the Billionaire League. It adds a whole new level of excitement to the game. And as for my personal experience, Pete and me have spent mm, countless hours, if I'm honest, enjoying the various games on Huge Casino, and it's hard to pick a favourite. But if I had to choose a favourite slot, I would say it has to be Dorothy's Adventure. It's a game that reimagines the story of The Wizard of Oz. This game offers a really unique twist on a classic tale, providing an engaging and potentially rewarding playing experience. We always try to beat each other, and I'm going to be honest, I think I'm way better at it than him. So... If you happen to be looking for a fun, engaging and social gaming experience, then Huge Casino is definitely worth checking out. Give it a try and who knows, we might just bump into one another at one of the clubs or at the slot machines and let's all practice that poker face together. Happy gaming, check out my link in the description to download Huge Casino for free and get 5 million chips. What's not to like? Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me as ever. Lots of you have requested this case. I also appreciate that I do have quite a tendency to cover children's deaths. And the reasoning behind that, if you're new to my channel, is I worked in safeguarding for a very long time in my career. It's an absolute privilege to be an individual responsible for making sure that children are given the correct protections. And as a mandated reporter, it was part of my duty to highlight these issues should a child that I was working with come to attention that they are being abused or suspicions of abuse, in fact. And it's heartbreaking for me when children slip through the net and where tragedies like this unfold, because as human adults, children are our ward. They're our job to protect. And if the parents aren't protecting them, then it's the duty of those around that child to step in. And like I said, when those failures occur that mean that this doesn't happen and that children needlessly die, it is not just heartbreaking, it's an indictment of the failure of our society. Our society should cradle these children and protect them. And too often than not, that fails. So many of you have asked me to look at this case and it was absolutely heartbreaking as ever. Whenever I cover a case of children, and don't get me wrong, every single case I cover on my channel, I remember the names of those individuals whose lives have been lost. But there is just something 
so provocative, evocative, cerebral, visceral about seeing a child's life stolen that I will always hold all that key information about what happened to them in my head and in my heart because it gives me a sense of holding on to their legacy and they deserve it. When others were so happy to throw away their life, people like you and I holding on to the knowledge of what happened to them and sharing our emotions and empathy towards the victim. I think that's so powerfully important. I genuinely do. Hopefully I'll have done this justice. If you're new to my channel, my content is always released on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So if you like crime and consistency and deep dives with a psychological slant, then this is definitely the channel for you. And thanks as ever to every single one of you who is supporting me on Patreon and YouTube community. I can't do this without you. You are absolutely awesome. And thank you to all of you who simply return to my channel to watch my content. You are incredible. Thank you so much. Let's talk about Imani. So Imani Gabriel Moss was born on the 23rd of April, 2003 in Lawrenceville, Georgia, USA. Her parents were her father, Iman Giovanni Moss, and her mother was a woman called Nita Leakes. Now, shortly after Imani's birth, her mother, who was struggling with dependency issues, she was a drug addict, she actually surrendered her parental rights, and that meant that Imani's father gained sole custody. And usually that would be a positive thing, because after all, it's better for a dependent who knows that they're not capable of giving the protection to the child that they've given birth to, that they forward that child to somebody who absolutely can do that. Um, in this case, it should have been Imani's father because he gained sole custody, therefore she is completely within his protection and he should have stepped up to the mark. He doesn't, but it just feels so heartbreaking because there are so many people out there who, if you don't want to bring up your child, will happily, willingly, and with absolute pleasure and love bring up your child for you. He doesn't choose for that to happen. Now, Imani was actually one of five children born to her mother, and she actually surrendered parental rights to all of her children. And whilst it can be very easy to step back and judge somebody like that with respect, I think it's quite traumatic to go through a pregnancy and then give your child away, and she at least gives life to those children. I think there is a courage there, no matter how dysfunctional that comes from. And logistically, it's really sad that all of those children are surrendered. But nonetheless, she obviously does that with an intention that they're going to have a better life experience without her present. Now, Eman raised Imani and part of his raising of her, which I think initially was a lot less problematic than we arrive at in this particular case. He did go to church, so he'd often go to the Freedom Christian Church and he's single so understandably, he probably is looking for an appropriate partner and he meets one in his mind. He meets Tiffany Moss. She's a preschool teacher. So she's obviously educated. She's been through the education system. She's succeeded. You don't get to be a preschool teacher unless you've done that. And can we also bring in the realisation at this moment that she is also a mandated reporter. She is an individual whose job and duty it is to safeguard her students. So she will be fully aware of the expectations and the legal ramifications when an adult fails to treat a child appropriately. She is educationally trained and she is also safeguarding trained. Now, Emma and Tiffany, they marry in July 2009 and they go on to have two children together, a son and a daughter. Imani, even though she is a step sister is apparently a hugely loving sister. In fact, I've listened to the testimony of one of her teachers and she talked about the fact that she was just a really empathic, compassionate child. She wanted to be liked. She struggled if people didn't like her and she would go out of her way to create relationships that were positive, even when there were challenges within those relationships initially. And that's really unusual for a young girl. Also, it speaks volumes potentially about the hard work she was used to in relationships. Because if you're used to having to go above and beyond because people aren't being necessarily that nice to you, then you're gonna know how to use that as a blueprint for other relationships. And so Imani's relational behavior is likely down to the fact that at home she's having a horrible time. 
and she's having to try to make great efforts with her caregivers to get any positive attention. So when she's at school and there are fallouts and problems with peers, she knows how to work hard at solving those relationship issues. And that's really sad when you actually look at it in that context. When teachers were asked to describe the kind of young girl she was, they talk about her being a really sweet, gentle girl. She apparently really loved to smile. She's a gorgeous looking little girl. But Tiffany, her mother, in this moment, as in stepmother, but the person who's bringing her up in that parental role, allegedly, from the get-go, she resented bringing up a child that was not biologically hers. Well, you know what, Tiffany? Why don't you have a conversation with your partner? If he's a deadbeat, he'll probably allow that child to be passed on to somebody else, and you can carry on in your little happy family trajectory without harming that kid. But that's not where Tiffany is going to go in this case. So she was so resentful of this beautiful little girl that everybody else says was an absolute delight that she would go out of her way to message Imam whilst he's at work. She would complain to him that his daughter was constantly misbehaving, which was untrue. But bear in mind, she's obviously from the get-go looking for any fracture, any problem, any possibility to project any resentment that she holds onto this child. And by texting him these things, it's leveraging a permission base for her to treat this beautiful little girl who's meant to be her ward, her care, because she's her stepdaughter, and instead is using these opportunities to abuse her. So she's forming this picture with Iman, who's away from home working, that his daughter is being a real problem. Likely, the reality is she wasn't doing anything at all. Like I said, she's just creating a narrative that enables her to be abusive to her stepdaughter. Now, initially, it seems that it's less abusive and more likely to do with Tiffany just overlooking Imani in favour of her biological children. So that is how it originally begins, that she isn't as concerned about Imani. She's not taking as much interest in Imani. She's not making her feel special as she is doing her own children. And let's put into position the psychological impact that would have on Imani. She's witnessing this woman who has two biological children consistently favouring those children, actively doing it in a very obvious way. For Imani, that's going to be deeply upsetting. She's going to probably think that there's something wrong with her. Children don't interpret the world like adults. They don't have the nuances. Even adults struggle sometimes with those nuances themselves and blame themselves for a person being nasty towards them and nice to other people. But to a child, they haven't formed the understanding of the world around them. All they know is that a mother and a father or a mother and a stepfather or a father and a stepmother are meant to love you in a way that's obvious because they see it play out in other relationships. And when that's not happening, it's really easy to internalise what could be going wrong with them as an individual. Maybe I'm not a good enough little girl. Maybe I need to do more for stepmom. Maybe I need to be quieter and so on and so forth. And to imagine that Imani is likely seeing this play out and trying to manage her relationship by being nicer to her stepmom or being quieter towards her are all things that will have played out in this relationship. And it's just absolutely devastating to think of a child having to do those things because they have somebody sinister with respect in their life. We get to March 2010. She's six at this point, just six years of age. Imani actually goes and tells a school nurse that she's scared of going home. She was afraid of having a bad report card. And bear in mind, whenever there were some issues at school, it was never to do with Imani's behaviour. Quite the contrary, she was seen as a really positive, lovely child. It was to do with failing to complete homework. Now, anybody in the history of having a child of that age knows it's not their job to do the homework. It's the parent's job to sit down and do the homework with the child. A six-year-old child is going to need that support and structure. So when they send report cards home, the reality is it's going to the parent. The parent's seeing it and thinking, oh, I really need to get my ass into gear and sit down with my child and do that work. It's a message to them. But Imani feels that if one of those cards goes home, there's going to be serious consequences and repercussions. And that means that firstly, she's having to do the work herself. 
And secondly, she's feeling overwhelmed by that or isn't being given the opportunity to do that. And then finally, even though that's reality, should that bad report card end up getting sent, she's gonna suffer. So she can't win on any level. And she actually confides that she thinks her parents will hurt her. She also then goes on, because clearly the nurse is interested and needs to listen to this information because she's a mandated reporter, but also is gonna clearly care about this little girl she gets more information out of her. So Imani admits that her stepmother often spanks her with a curtain rod. She's six. She's six. At this point, the nurse actually finds multiple scabs, bruises, welts on Imani's arms, on her back, on her chest, on her legs, on her shoulders. So that gives you an overview of the level of abuse being levied at this child. She's six and she has welts and bruises and breaks in her skin because she has been beaten by a curtain rod. Now, personally, I think that any adult who does that to a child should never be allowed near a child again. I don't think second chances should happen where children are so badly abused. We're talking about a weapon being used and we're talking about multiple injuries. At that point, I'm out. At that point, on a safeguarding level, how can that person ever be around that child again and be trusted to be around that child? Now, the nurse immediately reports this to social services because deeply concerned about what's happening to this gorgeous little girl. And obviously, Tiffany can't really get away with denying it because she's the person who's present and in care of Imani, and Imani has also confided that she's the person who's done it. So Tiffany does admit to hitting her two or three times because apparently she hadn't finished her homework on time. So she would see it as fit to use a curtain roll to actually attack a child for not completing her homework on time. And while she's trying to minimise it by suggesting she's hit her two to three times, it's really irrelevant. The fact that she would strike a child in this way for such a small misdemeanour demonstrates the gravity that this woman is capable on an abusive level. Now, she goes ahead and pleads guilty because she has literally no choice. And at this point, they place her on probation for five years. And that's as part of Georgia's first offender programme, because obviously she hasn't got a history of criminal behaviour. The Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services, the GDFCS, they actually signed the plea deal. So this is what she's agreed to. The GDFCS then dismiss a case against Tiffany and Eamon after they actually complete a parenting and anger management course. So that was part of what they needed to do to make sure that they didn't end up in prison. And understandably, Tiffany lost her job as a preschool teacher. Of course she did. You can't be a teacher in charge of child protection, which is a part of your role, and beat your own stepdaughter up. You're clearly not somebody who is safe to be around children. But of course, as opposed to being responsible and accountable and thinking, my God, I absolutely deserve this course of action. I have abused a child that I'm meant to be protecting and looking after. That's not how it works out. Tiffany blames Imani. As far as she's concerned, she is the reason that she lost her job. Not her actions, not the abuse. No, Imani confiding in that nurse, that's the issue. And again, that demonstrates the danger that Imani is in. Because this is a woman who, even when she is called to account and convicted of an offence that leads to her losing her job, she does not feel to blame. She feels her stepdaughter is to blame. She is racking up this permission base to be as abusive as she can to this gorgeous little girl. So following this event, Imani is actually removed from her father and stepmother's home, rightfully so, and she's placed with a grandmother, Robin, who adores her. Robin is a really lovely grandmother and a really great influence in this little girl's life. And she stays with her grandmother for about six months. During this time, Imani's school performance improved and obviously she is going to feel safe because she's not being abused by the person who she's living with. She's being cared for. 
But all the while, Iman fights for custody of Imani, and by autumn 2010, the GDFCS return her to him. Why? Why? Listen, at this point, there is no reason to take a child who is thriving with a grandmother who is not violent and replacing that situation with one of fear, with one where she will be living with a person who is very unhappy with her around and where her father isn't that present because he's working. So arguably, they are agreeing to release this little girl from the care of somebody who is compassionate and loving and to place her back in the lion's den with a woman who firstly doesn't want her, secondly has abused her at a high level and also has failed to take any responsibility or accountability for the reality of her actions. Now I appreciate that Iman may have felt that he wanted to have control, it's his family, he wanted to be the father, he wanted his biological daughter present and maybe he doesn't believe at this point that his partner is as violent and as evil as she has the potential to be, but it would have made sense to have a conversation with Tiffany about whether it was appropriate to have Imani back. Equally, it could be that those conversations took place and Tiffany wants Imani back because she likes punishing her. Because as far as I'm concerned, we're not just dealing with a case of abuse, where a parent, shall we say, has poor impulse control and acts in a completely reprehensible way on a consistent level, we're talking about somebody who is sadistic. She's sadistic. She enjoys inflicting pain. Tiffany gets some kind of feedback of a positive nature by acting in the way that she does around Imani. So it could be that she does want her back just so she can make her suffer. She doesn't want her staying with her grandmother Robin, somebody who's looking after, who's loving her, who's making her feel safe and secure. No. She wants to make sure that Tiffany is brought back so that now she has power to wield over her. And that is very sadistic. And don't get me wrong, Robin fought really hard. She wanted to retain custody of her granddaughter, but she was denied. Because why would we leave a child in the custody of somebody who's actually safe when we can send them to a position and a place which is full of danger, and that has been evidenced to be full of danger, and that has actually involved a criminal record because that individual poses such a danger. And for Imani, to know that she's going back there must have been absolutely horrifying, because as a kid you just want the person that you like or love to make you feel safe and allow you to stay, and she would be like that with Robin, she'd be desperate for Robin to just figure out a way for her not to have to go back to Tiffany and to her father. Now in 2012, Imani actually attempts to run away from home and she went to the apartment office and she said that she didn't want to go home. She said the reason that she didn't want to go home was because her stepmom had actually tied her up with a belt and placed her in a cold shower. Now the police responded to this and Tiffany Moss said Imani was lying. Yeah, apparently a high level abuser who's been noted in the criminal system to be a high-level abuser, yeah, she can just say that the man is lying and the police are like, well, we don't really have a lot of evidence for the charge, so we'll just send her home. What could possibly go wrong? So now Tiffany is aware that she can just fabricate a reality and even though they should be more diligent in looking at this case, they'll just accept what she's saying verbatim. Then July 2012, Imani runs away again. This is a kid. This is a young kid. And when she's found, she's actually sleeping in the bushes of a nearby apartment complex. She's found by a police officer. What does that tell you? This is a little girl. She would rather sleep in the bushes of a nearby apartment than risk being at home. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes, do you? It's not difficult to do the maths. What young kid is like, oh, you know what? I've got a house to stay, it's perfectly all right, but you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna risk going and sleeping outside in some bushes, in the wide open where, I don't know, anybody could find me or take me and terrible things could happen to me. I'm gonna do that because it seems like a great idea with respect to the fact that I've got a home over there that I could just go and sleep in. Clearly, the reason that that kid is 
going through the process of coming to that conclusion that the bushes are safer is because her home is 100% not safe. She's trying to escape. Now, Imani goes and tells the officer that she had to run away and she had to run away because her stepmother was mean to her. So that officer then reports the event to the GSFCS and filed runaway and curfew violation charges against Imani so they could ensure that she would see a juvenile court judge, obviously with the hope of, I don't know, someone taking some action, but it doesn't feel as if any action is taken in spite of this. Now, during some of this period, there is a level of transition within the family themselves. So from 2011 to the summer of 2013, it seems like Tiffany's father and stepmother are moving around a bit, sometimes living with family. And understandably, when people are in those kind of transitions, it does make it a little bit more difficult for services to follow them. And it can make it more challenging for the child because people are not aware of what's playing out in their lives. But then we get to the 12th of May, 2013. So the family, during this period of time of moving around, they visit Iman's sister. She's called Sharon Neist. So Sharon Neist has them over for Mother Day. Now, Sharon Neist and Robin, who is the grandmother in this case, one of the things that they notice straight away that deeply concerns them is that Iman's hair has been cut. Now, when Robin confronts Tiffany about it, she reported just says to her, if you act ugly, you should look ugly. Oh... Honestly, the amount of comments that I would be ready to come back with in that moment. I'm not saying it wouldn't escalate an already tension-filled scenario, but I would have quite a few quips if somebody like Tiffany said to me that if you act ugly, you look ugly. Because hell, this woman, she must be the ugliest person you ever seen. Genuinely, because Tiffany's actions are per se are ugly. So one can only imagine that if that played out, what she would look like would be something like, I don't know, a hive of boils with pus emanating from every single part of them. Something like that. And I've not even started to imagine how it would be if you brought the pimple popper in to that situation. Forget it. I've gone down some really weird route there. You know what I'm saying though. You know what I'm saying. Just saying, Tiffany acts very ugly and therefore must look very ugly. Definitely inside. Definitely inside. In every single cell. Ugly. Now, Sharonice also noted that one of the things that seems to have changed around Imani is her behaviour. So she's acting really, really timid. And bear in mind, she's been with Robin. So she'll have seen the little girl getting more confident, feeling safer, feeling happier in her nature. And then she's gone back to Tiffany and clearly there is a drop in her behaviour. She's looking timid, she's being quieter, and that will be because there will be consequences should she dare to raise her voice in any way, shape or form, on a metaphoric and a literal level. So if she makes herself visible in any way, there'll be consequences. Now, after the 2012 to 2013 school year ended, Eman and Tiffany actually decide that they're going to pull Imani out of school and teach her at home, and that is automatically a big red flag. When you have abusive parents, and they have been proven to be criminally abusive, the last thing that you want is to have a child pulled out of school because they ain't doing it because they're suddenly a close, connected relationship. They're doing it because they want to be able to get away with stuff. They want to be able to do things to the child, and they don't want any prying eyes on that child. The very fact that Imani was getting beaten with a curtain pole because she wasn't doing her homework tells you they're not supportive anyway. So why would they want to homeschool her? Yes, I appreciate Tiffany is qualified in early years when it comes down to teaching, but no. She's demonstrated she has no care, compassion, understanding, or actual ambition to be a positive role model in a man's life. Now, Sharon Neese, she objects to the idea, rightfully so, because she's an absolutely decent human being. She actually goes ahead and calls GDCFS and says, you need to intervene. And you know what they did? They were like, okay, why should we intervene? Well, 
you should intervene because this child has been beaten with a curtain rod and has complained numerous times about the fact that she's been abused and has literally run away and slept in bushes to avoid being at home. And at school, the evidence showed that she was beaten for not completing the work, so she's not getting the support at home. So it wouldn't make sense, therefore, that she would be educated at home on the basis that tensions run high, she's been a victim, and the consequences of her not being seen by adult educators who could actually help if anything goes wrong, that would seem like a terrible idea if it went ahead. So I'm saying she should go to school. I think she should be home educated. Have you got any reasons for that? Because I don't care. Because I, I don't care. I don't care. Everything you just said, I think it made sense, but it was just like a it was a whirring noise in my, and then I was just thinking about what I was going to have for a meal this evening. I kid you not, I genuinely think that's how it plays out in these circumstances. Somebody comes with a logical, reasoned response as to why an individual should not be taken out of school, and the person who actually makes the decision really doesn't care, and is just not concerned, and can't see A, B, and C no matter how illuminated it is. It's ludicrous. We get to the 6th of August 2013. At this point, GDFCS, they receive an anonymous tip that Imani is being neglected by her father and her stepmother and appeared to be thin. What is this organisation doing? Genuinely. Because they're not doing the job, are they? I have deep reservations about some of the workers in these scenarios and some of their stereotypes and biases and how they project those stereotypes and biases onto particular children. And I feel that Imani is a recipient of some stereotypes, prejudice and biases. I genuinely do. Because they're not taking it seriously, even though there was literally a breadcrumb trail to a massive signal of abuse. It's all there from adults reporting, nurses reporting, People privately, anonymously reporting, members of the family reporting, criminal convictions occurring, still, apparently nothing is happening. Now that Mother's Day 2013 was the actual last time any members of Marnie's family, beside her father, stepmother and siblings, actually saw her alive. And it's late summer 2013, the family then move into an apartment in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Now, according to District Attorney Danny Porter, this was when, quote, for all intents and purposes, Imani vanished from the face of the earth. Now, bear in mind, Iman is working two jobs. So he's largely absent, basically, from Imani's life. That doesn't give him any excuse. If you're a father and you're working your ass off, you're still going to make time to see your kid. You don't get any pass because you're not present all the time. It's easy to see when a child is being abused. It's easy to see when a child is being starved. These are things that are physically playing out in front of your eyes. Now, allegedly, he would leave for his first job early in the morning. He'd briefly return in the late afternoon. Time to see your kid then. Lots of time, she'd been homeschooled, so lots of time. And then after appearing back in the late afternoon, he would leave for his second job around 6 p.m. And then he would return to the family home around 10.30 to 11 p.m. So whilst Emma's at work, Tiffany Moss is left to care for the children. It's at this point that it appears Tiffany Moss starts to confine Imani to her bedroom. And one of the reasons that we can take that as a reality is that neighbours only ever saw Tiffany's biological children. In fact, they didn't even know that those little kids had an older sibling. They were unaware that Imani even lived at that building, that's really disturbing because it means that she was obviously made to be quiet. She wasn't seen by people because she was basically a prisoner. And it also means that there was no opportunity for others to support because no one would really have known that the abuse was occurring. We get to autumn 2013 and it's not enough now for Tiffany Moss to just isolate this little girl. She is growing used to that feeling of how it is to dominate in this way. So she needs to up the ante basically. And she decides that the way to do that is to starve Imani. Now, bear in mind the agony of starvation. For those of you who don't know about what plays out when somebody is starving to death, it is agonizing. 
the hunger pangs are unbelievably distressing. And we're talking about a kid, 10-year-old kid. But add to that, aside from the agony of that, it's then the listlessness, it's the lethargy, it's the fatigue, it's the absolute exhaustion. As your body basically ingests all of your muscle, etc., you are essentially dying by eating yourself alive to some degree. And it doesn't take long, although it would feel endless for a child going through this, but it doesn't take long for her to start becoming so weak that she can't move. She couldn't leave a bed. She couldn't leave a bed to even urinate or defecate. So now she's literally lying in her own mess, which again, on an infection level, is very dangerous. When you're already exhausted, when you're already in a scenario where you don't have the immunity to fight infections because you're so weak, this is putting you 100% at a risk of death. And Tiffany Moss is watching this play out in real time. Now, she was so brutal in the way that she did this, it demonstrates the sadism I'm talking about. So not only does she deny food to Imani, she's obviously, during this period, taking perfect care of her other two biological kids. So Imani is wasting away. She is dying in front of Tiffany Moss's eyes. And yet she's also bearing witness to the other children who, by the way, Imani absolutely adored, being fed, being loved, being washed, being safe. On several occasions, Tiffany Moss was so calculating that she actually sent Iman pictures of meals that she prepared for her children that was all about making him believe that he was actually feeding Imani as well. So even though I think he's turning a blind eye to the abuse, I don't think he's anywhere near as acutely aware of just how much danger Imani is in. But how neglectful are you as a father? How neglectful are you if you don't even check in with your child on a daily level? The very fact that he's accepting things the way that they are, that makes him culpable. There's another occasion as well where Tiffany Moss actually asked him to bring home some cookie dough. And the reason for that is she wanted to torture Imani with the smell of cookies because she would obviously smell them as they baked. And we all know how delicious cookies smell when they're baking. And she would be lying there starving to death where every second, every minute would just be agonizing. And she'd be knowing that that smell was coming into her room because she was going to be denied what her siblings were going to be given. It is just brutal and sadistic on a whole different level. We get to the early evening of October the 24th, 2013. Now at this point, Amani suffers what Iman, her father said, he believed was a seizure. Iman comes home from work that evening and Tiffany Moss at this point basically informs him that something is going on with Amani, there's something wrong with her. He then goes into the bathroom and imagine this playing out. Your partner, tells you that there's something wrong with your daughter. That partner should be frantic. That partner should be doing everything in their power to help the child. They shouldn't be coming in and informing you there's something wrong with Imani and leaving the child in the bathroom by themselves because, hey, you're frantic, you're terrified, you're horrified, something bad is going on. You need to heal and help that child in distress. He goes into the bathroom and he finds his daughter in the bathtub shaking. Why is she in the bathtub? Why is she shaking? Something is deeply wrong. Ring 911. Also, she's really responsive. Her eyes were rolling back and forth. And what does he do in that moment? He moves Imani back to her bed where she literally stays. So he does nothing. He could call the emergency services. There is hope. There is a chance for Imani at this point, potentially. But no. Knowing what a state of distress she is in, knowing how thin she must have appeared, because boy, was that child skinny. Instead of acting in her best interest, he basically supports Tiffany, doesn't he? He just puts her in bed and hopes, probably, that it will all be okay. He does visit her during that time. He does try to feed her at this time. 
but he's unsuccessful. So as opposed to thinking, well, this is really bad. I found my kid, eyes rolling to the back of the head, having some kind of fit. They're not eating. They're unbelievably underweight and I can't get any food or water into them. Maybe I need to get a professional who can help. Doesn't do it. There is no way you don't know what's coming next. Yes, you can willfully be blind to it, but you still know. You understand. My child is dying. There is no doubt whatsoever. He knew she was dying. The 28th of October 2013, finally, Imani succumbs to the horror that has been her torture and dies. Tiffany calls Iman at work and says that his daughter has died. He comes back to find Imani lying on a blanket on a bedroom floor. He then says to his wife, well, we need to call the police. But she says no. At the end of the day, she's still on probation for abusing Imani back in 2010. And she fears that this will mean that she'll lose custody of her two biological children. So her thought in the moment when Imani has lost her life is that she needs to protect her own future with her kids in spite of stealing the life of Imani. All she cares about in that moment is herself. It demonstrates that firstly, she was prepared for this death because in a scenario where you are truly shocked, where you didn't have an intention for something terrible to happen, you're going to act in a much more linear way, which is, oh my God, how has this happened? And even if you're culpable, you're probably going to process the moment by calling emergency services. Yeah, you might give them some excuses. Yeah, you might end up getting arrested and charged. But the point is you're dealing with it in a more linear fashion because you're acting from a feeling of, oh my God, what has happened? I didn't want Imani to die. She shouldn't be dead. Let's try our best to get some help or at least let's acknowledge what's happened and deal with the situation as it plays out. That's not where Tiffany is psychologically. She's like, how do I look after myself? Again, sadistic egocentric, unbelievably selfish beyond belief. And Tiffany says to Iman, they need to hide Imani's body and be on our criminal mind quote. So basically, let's think how criminals think. Let's act how criminals act. That's how we've got to do it. We've got to think this way. Because basically they both are now. So actually it's literal, isn't it? Iman wraps Imani's body with blankets and then moves her body to the computer room and then they just leave her. They kept her body there for several days and just got on with their lives as normal. How sinister is that? The decomposing body of a little girl just stored in the computer room. He goes to work. She carries on being mum to the kids. Just pretends everything's okay. The level of disassociation there is so grave, it's unbelievable. That little girl's body, broken, malnourished, abused beyond belief, and now just stored like an item, like a belonging in the computer room. Understandably, the couple now have a problem. They've agreed together to cover up Imani's death, but they have a body that needs to be disposed of. Now, one of the things that they do on the 29th of October, this is the day after she actually died, Tiffany goes to a place called Anna's Linens and she bought new bed sheets because the ones that Imani had used were obviously covered in excrement and urine. Tiffany also suggested at this point burying Imani and reporting her as a runaway, then she actually changes her mind and says, no, let's not do that, let's cremate her. But they do go ahead and inform the police that she is a runaway. And of course, why? She's done it before and it's gonna buy them time. But she's planning, isn't she? She's going out and getting new sheets because obviously there's the problem with the old sheets and she's plotting how to dispose of this child's body. And Iman doesn't think, well, this is absolutely insane. We're getting ourselves deeper and deeper in trouble here. I'm now an absolute co-conspirator. I'm now as culpable to some degree as you are. No. He just goes out, buys a steel can, bin bags, charcoal, and lighter fluid. And all the while that he would have been buying that, he knows what he's intending to do with those things. 
He's going to burn the body of his beautiful little girl. He's going to do some kind of home cremation job. It's so diabolical. How do you go through the motions of living? How do you purchase those kind of items all the while knowing what they're intended for? We get to the 31st of October. This is when Tiffany and Aman decide to put Amani's body into that bin and burn her. So the big problem that they get straight off is when they try to place Imani's body in the bin, well, she's stiff. Rigor mortis is set in. So that's a problem because now they have to figure out a way to compress her body. And the way they do that is firstly to use duct tape and then to break her bones so that her body would fit. How does any human being with a shred of dignity, with a shred of humanity, with a shred of compassion in their body ever do something like that? They wouldn't, would they? You can't act in this way if you have a shred of humanity running through your veins. You can't. They break the bones of this child who was starved to death so they can effectively cremate her. Eman then covers her body with the blanket and on the 1st of November they load the bin containing Imani's body into the car and then they drive to this rural secluded area and they even take the other two kids with them. What a day out. What a family trip. Just going to go and get in the car and go for a drive, kids. Oh, that's that in the back. Just a bin. What's in it? The broken body of your sister that we're now going to set on fire. Would you like a cookie? Genuinely. What kind of human beings are capable of doing this? And then capable of bringing their two children with them to do that. When they arrive where they need to arrive, they remove the bin from the car, then they get the charcoal, put that in the bottom of the bin, and then they douse that beautiful child's broken body in lighter fluid, and then set her on fire. They watch the fire for about five minutes, because clearly they want to know that it's working, and then they realise, to their horror, the body isn't going to burn entirely. Of course it isn't. The temperature that you need to do that is significantly higher than what they're going to be able to achieve. So now they have another problem. They have a child's partially burnt body and still she's not going to be easy to completely dispose of in the way that they thought they'd be able to do. So then they extinguish the fire and then they take the bin. And Iman is now burnt, broken body, back to their apartment. (sighs) These human beings do not deserve to be categorised as human beings. I'm sorry. And they're not animals. Because animals don't treat each other this way. We get to the investigation because on the 2nd of November, a man goes to work with Imani's body still in the back of his car and it feels as if she is creeping into his conscience. She is affecting him. Her presence, even though it is her absence within that presence, is haunting. And whilst I don't believe this man has a shred of humanity, What I do know is I've watched how guilt can manifest. I've watched how somebody, even with a low conscience, can start to feel really affected by certain actions that are in character with how they would choose to have normally acted. Bear in mind, Tiffany Moss has brought him in to this plan. He wasn't the carver of it. He was useless. He was complicit. He colluded. And he's definitely, definitely somebody deserving of his punishment. But it wasn't his initial choice. So now it's starting to bother him and he ends up confessing to a friend at work what he and Moss had done. And that friend understandably is like, man, you need to call the police. And there are reasons why a friend would do that. Firstly, they're a true friend because they're advising you correctly. Secondly, they know that if you don't, there is a stronger consequence should they find that your child's gone missing and you've hidden it and not admitted 
that can be an even steeper sentence when it comes down to being found guilty. And of course, the other thing is there is a murderer on the loose. In this case, Tiffany, she's a dangerous person. So on every level, he needs to inform the emergency services. Apparently, Eman thought about this for a while, but then 4 a.m. in the morning, he made the call and he actually tells the police at this point that he was suicidal. I imagine he was because I imagine that he was thinking, my life is over, and that's what was driving him with those feelings. Not, I want to die, because clearly he didn't, but I feel my life is over. So it tallies with that feeling of being suicidal to some degree. Eman then told Tiffany that he told the police, and at this point she placed the bin containing Eman's body in a grassy area, basically, near their apartment, and then she leaves with her kids. That's all she's thinking about. Well, now they've got this on me, I gotta get out of here. When the police arrive at the apartment, Iman tells them that his daughter had actually drank some chemicals and died. He then concocts this ludicrous story where he suggests that he panicked and he put her body in a bin outside the apartment and just tried to cremate her, said no innocent person ever. I mean, it's ludicrous, isn't it? Sorry, sir, can you just run through that again? Um, well, my daughter, my, my child, she drank chemicals and died. Okay, right, okay, just run through what you did after she died. Well, I panicked because she had drank chemicals and died, and I felt that the next step was to put her in a bin and to place lighter fluid on her and to set her on fire and then to dump her body. It felt like the most logical action for an innocent person who had nothing to do with the chemicals being ingested. Are you buying this? No, sir. We, we, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not in the shop of buying these thoughts from somebody who's clearly a maniac. Anyway, do apologize for that dreadful accent. I think I was in some kind of 1940s black and white movie then. So to anybody in the USA going, is she being Scottish? I apologise. That was my attempt. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on with that. But nobody who is innocent is going to say that a child has drank chemicals and died. The only thing you're going to do in that circumstance is break down, call emergency services, beg them to help your kid, and hope to God, by some miracle, they're going to be able to save them. And if you can't save them, and those professionals can't save them, you're just going to spend time feeling guilty about the fact they got hold of some chemicals. But you're not going to be somebody who thinks about putting them in a bin and burning them because you didn't do anything wrong, aside from maybe not storing the chemicals in a place that would have been safer. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So the police don't buy into any of it. And the police then quickly find Imani's body. Don't believe Iman's story because it's ludicrous. And then promptly identify both him and, of course, Tiffany as the main suspects. Iman is arrested immediately at the scene. Tiffany, however, she actually drops her children off at her mother's house. But then after a period of time, ultimately turns herself in because... She's bound to rights. There's absolutely no way whatsoever she's going to get away with this. She's going to have to turn herself in. Isn't it interesting, though? All the while that she had been absolutely horrific to Imani, she cares for her own children. And that's really important because this is not somebody who is not within her wits. This is a woman who knows how to treat children well on one hand and knows how to abuse them horrifically on the other. This is not somebody struggling with impulse control. This is someone very able to control the way that they behave. Ultimately, she's made a decision to abuse and destroy this little girl. Make no bones about it. She's not out of her mind. She's completely capable of bringing up children effectively and caring about them even until the last minute before she's essentially arrested by putting them in the care of her own mother. So when Emma Moss is arrested, he confesses to covering up Imani's murder by reporting her as a runaway and also, of course, trying to burn her body. In an interview, Eman was visibly upset and he says to the detectives, I'm guilty. I killed my baby. 
I mean, with respect, using the word baby is a term of endearment and it's ludicrous. He didn't treat her like his baby in any way, shape or form. He let a monster look after her. He was aware that there was a failure to protect her consistently and he let her starve to death and then he broke her body into pieces basically when she had rigor mortis. So guilt may be coming through, but that ain't for the loss of his daughter. That's for his own loss of freedom. That's for him actually acknowledging his actions, realising what a monster he must be because of that and ultimately breaking down. In 2015, he then went ahead and pled guilty to felony murder and concealing a death. And because he did that, he basically got life in prison without the possibility of parole. And that was in exchange for not facing the death penalty. And part of the plea as well was that he had to agree to basically give evidence against Tiffany Moss, who was gonna testify against his wife. And Eman is currently incarcerated at the Smith State Prison in Glenville, Georgia. Now we get to the Tiffany Moss trial. Bizarre is what I'm going to say. Bizarre, really bizarre. So first of all, Tiffany Moss rejects a plea deal. Now that plea deal would have seen her sentenced to life in prison. So therefore she wouldn't receive the death penalty. She might not get the life that she wanted, but essentially she would have a life, albeit one incarcerated. But it would mean, of course, that essentially she could go on to live and lead some semblance of an experience of a world that she inhabits by doing courses and having jobs as they do in prison, forging relationships. This was all possible. I know it's not ideal. No one wants to find themselves locked up for the rest of their natural life, but it usually is a more positive reality than getting put to death. But anyway, she's like, no, I'm not going to read that. Why? I just am not going to. It's kind of a good deal on the basis that you banged the rights and everybody knows what you did and it was horrendous and torturous and now we'll have to go to a trial where the whole world will find out what a monster you are and the result will be likely that there is a chance you'll be put to death. I want to do that. I'm going to do that. Weird. It's all strange, this situation. So basically, the trial begins April 15, 2019. It's presided over by George, George Hutchinson. The jury consisted of six men and six women, so quite balanced in that respect. And there were six charges against Tiffany Moss. So she had one count of malice murder, two counts of felony murder, two counts of cruelty to children, and one count of concealing a death. Maximum penalty was capital punishment, literally getting put to death. A lot of you out there, by the way, might absolutely 100% think, yeah, good. She 100% deserves it. What she did was utterly brutal. Essentially the equivalent of what people experienced in concentration camps, genuinely. Being in prison, starved to death slowly, executed over a long period of time, essentially. And Tiffany Moss, at this point, was appointed lawyers, of course, because they need to have her defended. So they appointed the lawyers through the state office of Capital Defender and she was like, well, that might be one route, but why don't I take another one? I'll represent myself. This is somebody who has no legal experience. We're not talking about an idiot like Ted Bundy who failed at law, but obviously had some experience, right? We're talking about somebody who had no experience in the law. And this particular kind of law is very high level. You have to be a very experienced attorney to defend somebody in such a case. And she's like, it's fine. I will do it for myself. This is despite the judge themselves trying to persuade her otherwise. He stated, they are trying to have you executed. And I can't be more blunt than to say they are trying to have you killed. That's just as serious as it can possibly get. And I think it's best that you have an attorney. But instead she was just like, hey, at the end of the day, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this in for a penny, in for a pound. How hard can it be? I've watched some kind of lawyer programs on TV. I've watched Suits. It'll be fine. I can do this, said no one with any sense whatsoever in such situations. Now, that meant that even though there were defense attorneys who were actually appointed, instead of actually representing her, they had to basically serve as standby attorneys to answer any legal questions, which would be every question. Can we be honest? Has anybody ever been in a court and sat there thinking, this is simple. This is really easy. This is really easy. When they use that language that nobody literally understands unless you've had many years of legal school. And when strange points of law and objections are actually raised, 
Why? Why? No one knows unless they are trained. Even those who are trained struggle very often in these circumstances and situations. You hear it constantly when you watch court TV. Even the lawyers struggle, but they're there to answer questions should they need to, which they really should. It does make you think at this point that that opportunity to defend yourself should be revoked, at least to a large degree. There should be some kind of collaboration required because it's clear that it should be totally out of debt. Now, during the pre-trial hearings and the jury selection, Judge Hutchinson urged Tiffany Moss to rely upon the standby counsel, but she just refused. And she instead stated that God would help her through. God will help me through. Do you, do you really believe that God will help you? God will help me through. I think that God tends to err on the side of victims. I'm just going to throw out there. like God tends to be more in a like zone for those who have been murdered as opposed to those who, usually that's a whole different God. It's like, it's a, it's a God with a elevator. That kind of God, is that the God you're talking about? God will see me through. Anyway, that's what she's gonna do. She's gonna get God to help her through it. And there was actually a veteran Atlanta criminal defense lawyer who was interviewed about his thoughts on her doing this. And he said, it looks like a prolonged suicide. God may be an all powerful and merciful force in nature, but he's a lousy defense lawyer. I think that's an appropriate, appropriate thing to state. Now, even though she has said that she wanted to represent herself, she doesn't really represent herself at all. She was incredibly passive. The DA, Danny Porter, said that sometimes it looks like she's looking at a blank wall, and it does. Moss didn't give an opening statement, which is obviously key. That's what you want to do, a really powerful, strong opening statement defending why you're there and why you're going at this point to not accept what had originally been levied against you, which is a murder charge, etc. She just doesn't engage. She doesn't offer any witnesses of her own. She doesn't cross-examine any witnesses. And on top of that, she doesn't give a closing argument. So basically, she does none of the things that we would expect to see in a normal trial. Now, lots of people can see this in lots of different ways and everybody is welcome to their own opinions. Please let me know in the comments below if you have yours. Personally, we could say this is somebody who is clearly losing her mind to some degree. She's not cogent. She's not aware. She's not capable. Or we can think, whoa, highly manipulative. Highly manipulative. Because it goes against the grain that an individual would choose to not introduce anybody into this circumstance who could at least give some mitigation for her actions. It's strange. Or if you're really believing that you are not guilty, you would have reason to cross-examine individuals to discredit their testimony. So the very fact that she is choosing not to do that may well be because she wants to appear like she really isn't present, that she really does have problems, that maybe this trial isn't necessarily that fair because, hey, they're letting this woman who's clearly not in her right mind represent herself and she's not even trying to fight it. So it could be that it's not that this woman isn't in her right mind. It's that this woman is playing a very convincing role to make people question whether it's appropriate she be tried in this way at all. Now, the fact that she doesn't do any of those things I've just said demonstrates that the jury is not going to have a difficult job. The prosecution, so Gwinnett County District Attorney Danny Porter and Assistant District Attorney Lisa Jones, who were prosecuting, they said in their closing statements very powerfully, this is a case of Cinderella gone horribly wrong. In this case, there won't be any glass slipper. There won't be any handsome prince. This is a case where you will only have the evil stepmother. As a result of that, a 10-year-old child is starved to death while her own children remained happy and healthy. Bear in mind the prosecution called 18 witnesses. They have her husband, Emma Moss, the father. He testified that his wife and daughter had apparently a, quote, love-hate relationship and couldn't get along. She was a kid. She was only 10 when she died. She was six when this woman came into her life. Are we being ludicrous here? They had a love-hate relationship. No, no, no. As a parent, it is your duty, whether you're a step-parent or a biological parent, to be a parent, to be loving and caring and compassionate. It's not for your child to get on with you, it's for you to forge a relationship with them by finding a way to connect. 
It's not easy being a step parent. I have a step family myself. You do the work. There isn't a love-hate relationship between a parent and a child or a step parent and a child. It's not the duty and job of that step parent to have anything other than love, even if it's difficult at times. He then admits that things got worse after the 2010 abuse case because Tiffany Moss blamed Imani for making her lose her job. And Iman also testified that in the days before Imani died, she'd had that seizure, which was likely due to starvation. And the, it was very clear at that point that Tiffany was not going to have any help from the doctors. She said to Iman that Imani was too thin. So that's why they put her to bed and that's why she died. So he said that when he came home on the 28th of October, the day that she died, family seemed normal. Children were playing, Tiffany was watching the TV. Could she be any more grotesque? Watching TV. When asked why he wasn't willing at that point to actually call 911 and override her, Iman said, I was just trying to fix a problem that couldn't be fixed. So bizarre. That means that Imani was seen as a problem. One, yes, ultimately that he couldn't fix because she was now dead, but she wasn't his child. She wasn't his baby. She was the problem. And yeah, they found a poor solution, but nonetheless, they were willing to try to find one as opposed to trying to help her when she needed it. Now, on the subject of keeping her body in the house for that period of time, Iman testified that he just went to work as normal, but then apparently he spent time at home with her body grieving. Did you? Did you? Did you? Did you really spend time at home with her body grieving? I did, I did. Was that before you smashed her body to pieces to put her in a bin and burn her? Yes, yes, before that, before I did that, yeah. Honestly, the things that I would like to happen when people get to do sob stories like that on the stand are not legal, are not legal. I can't even say it on this particular channel because likely somebody would complain and question whether I'm a safe human being to have around anybody who's carried out things like this, which I'm not, which is why I don't work in that area. Obviously, as long as you don't action the things that you think, it's okay. But I'm just saying, when people do these things and try to make you feel sorry for them, when they've done something so heinous, doesn't make him seem more humane at all. Because what he's saying is, oh yeah, I knowingly and willingly went and spent time with my child's dead body as opposed to called the emergency services and have that body taken care with appropriately. You know, so Robin, the grandparent, could maybe say her goodbyes, for example. So I don't buy into that at all. He also testified that Tiffany had wanted to bury the body, but he'd said no. Obviously, electing for burning it instead is a better idea. He also described the cracking of his daughter's bones, getting her body into the steel bin, and then the attempt to cremate her. Then, of course, finally, him choosing to ring 911, saying he was unable to live with the guilt. I just genuinely feel that I'm unwilling to afford him that level of conscience he's claiming, because what he did is too terrible to even imagine, let alone to go ahead and do. Now, the medical examiner, Dr. Staffenberg, he had the desperately unfortunate duty of performing the autopsy on Imani's body. And he said that the process of starving to death would have been absolutely agony. He said at first, Imani would have experienced deep hunger pains. And then she would become fatigued. She'd lose energy, she'd lose weight, and then she would die. He said, by the time that she died, she was so severely underweight that he described her as more or less skin and bones. She weighed 15 kilograms at the time of her death. That's the weight of an average three-year-old. An average three-year-old. When they did the autopsy, her organs were all found to be abnormally small and the jury had to sit and look at all of those upsetting autopsy photos to bring it home just how brutally this beautiful child had been treated. In the prosecution's closing argument, Jones actually said that Tiffany Moss killed Imani basically out of resentment, said that Tiffany was able to very well look after her biological children, but not Imani because apparently she wasn't deemed worthy enough. 
and describing how Tiffany saw Imani, the prosecution stated she was nothing. She was a nuisance, she was ugly, she was a pain, she was disposable, she was trash. So true. How can you look at that beautiful little girl's face and consider her those things? But she did, didn't she? That's exactly how Tiffany Moss saw that incalculably important precious child. A child who was so wanted by her grandmother. Tiffany Moss wanted her dead. She wanted to hurt her. She represented something that she wanted to cut out and destroy, and she did it. Jurors, when they were listening to that closing argument, ended up crying. They actually heard, on top of what I've just said, that Imani lived with the evils of this world, and I think that's so accurately put. It really is the evils of this world. They had lots of different witnesses that included Imani's aunt, her grandmother, and her fourth grade teacher. There were so many people who came to speak for that child who were so horrified at how this had played out and how let down they felt that this was allowed to play out. The verdict on the 29th of April, Moss was convicted on all six counts. It took them less than three hours to deliberate for that. And that's because firstly, she's guilty of hell. And secondly, she didn't put up a fight. Now, during the sentencing phase, Tiffany Moss declined to address the jury. She declined to present mitigating evidence or even have her relatives who attended the trial testify on her behalf. She also refused to present a closing argument. The prosecution, of course, they had a closing argument and they argued that Tiffany Moss did not deserve a life sentence, whether that be a life sentence with parole or without. He was very clear. He said she shouldn't be given the opportunity to be released because she would never change. He said she's shown you too much of her capacity for cruelty. There will always be the dark side waiting to come out. They also argued that for Tiffany Moss, life without parole wouldn't be a worse sentence than death because she didn't regret her crimes and would never be bothered by them. So it's not as if she was going to ever be able to learn or acknowledge remorse for what she did. Now, after the closing arguments, the jury began deliberating, and after the first day, they appeared quite conflicted. They were then told by the judge, Judge Hutchinson, to go home, sleep on it, and then continued the deliberations the next day, and they ultimately did agree on the death penalty. So the 1st of May, Judge Hutchinson actually agreed with the jury's recommendation and sentenced Tiffany Moss, then age 36, to death by lethal injection. In fact, Moss was the first person to be sentenced to death in Georgia in over five years. The last death row sentence had been in August in 2014. A guy called Adrian Hargrove had been convicted of killing three people, including a pregnant woman and her parents. Judge Hutchinson at this point actually scheduled her execution for between the 7th and 14th of June 2019. Now, the execution didn't actually occur during the June 7th to the 14th time frame due to the appeals process. So that resulted in an automatic stay of execution being applied to the initial scheduled execution date. Now, bear in mind that Tiffany Moss did not get any help when she was representing herself at the trial. They were there, but she didn't ask her legal counsel to help. It did turn out that when it came down to this particular sentence, she accepted legal representation in her appeal. So soon after she receives a death sentence, at this point, the Georgia Capital Defender Group, they filed a motion asking for a new trial. Now, they argued, I mean, amongst other things, that Tiffany Moss wasn't basically competent to act as her own attorney. According to her new attorneys, Tiffany Moss had neuropsychological testing data that showed that the defendant had damage to the premotor and prefrontal regions of the brain. So what they're basically suggesting here is that this would mean that she had issues in executive function, decision-making, and also impulse control. So these brain functions are pretty critical to making any rational judgments. And this is their argument as to why she did something so irrational as to represent herself. I'm really struggling. Genuinely, I appreciate it seems irrational that she would go ahead and represent herself when she's literally not at all knowledgeable and she is up for such serious offences. But... She was able to look after her other children perfectly well. She was able to teach perfectly well. She was able to drop off her own kids when she knew the game was up at her mother's for safeguarding perfectly well. 
She was able to concoct a plan to try to get away with the murder we're talking about today perfectly well. That ain't impulse control issues. That's just a sadist, pure and simple. And very likely a highly manipulative sadist who's now trying to appear, shall we say, a little bit like a victim. So because of this, there was a status hearing that regarded this motion held on the 23rd of August 2019. And Tiffany Moss is currently incarcerated at Arendelle State Prison. She's Georgia's only female death row inmate. And if Moss is actually eventually executed, she'll be the third woman in Georgia to be executed since 1945. That's how rare the death sentence is passed. It's incredibly unusual for women to be put to death. After Imani's death, the funeral took place 16th of November 2013 in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and there's nothing to celebrate in these circumstances, but what I would say, it was a very beautiful thing to behold. They released doves in front of the church in Imani's honour, and it demonstrates how, even though she was failed in so many ways, the community really did rally round to offer that legacy and to care deeply about her passing. When it came down to the children that were obviously left behind, because now the parents are both incarcerated, Bear in mind, they were still married when they were sent to prison. They obviously lost custody of the two children and those children were sent to live with foster parents and both Tiffany and Emon's mother, they did actually attempt to gain custody of the grandchildren, but sadly they were unsuccessful. And in an April 2019 interview, Porter actually told the local news that the children were now adopted by their foster parents. Tiffany Moss's son, who was three years old when Amani was murdered, he apparently did have some memories of the crime, but apparently, even though this is highly traumatic and terrible that he remembers these realities, Porter also said in the interview that he gave that the children were doing great and that hopefully over time they would forget what had happened if they even actually truly remembered. I can understand that they decided not to place the children with the biological family because I think when there is something so truly traumatic, it can hold that child back to that moment. They become victims for the rest of their lives. Whereas in this situation, a new start with parents who are not connected, that hopefully will mean that their life is all about the future and certainly not about the past, which is heinous and horrific. Now, following Emma and Tiffany's arrest, an intake case manager, a social services administrator, and a program assistant at the GDFCS were all fired. Good, because clearly they should have been. Multiple others reportedly received disciplinary action. Imani's death also resulted in systemic changes to the GDFCS that included things like deeper investigations into allegations of abuse. Why do we need deeper investigate? If there's an allegation of abuse, it should be deep. It's an allegation of abuse. You need it to be really deep. They also changed how it assembles the reports because clearly they were problematic. New case managers and supervisors were hired and they also decided on reduced caseloads. I do appreciate that in the UK, a lot of social care workers have huge caseloads and it means that they can't give each case the right amount of attention. That's not their fault. That's from above. And it's wrong that people who are in these situations where they start out wanting to care and take care of people who need the extra help and support are now put in positions where they can't give them the right amount of attention because they are so inundated with other cases that that needs to change. And it's clearly the same in Georgia. Also, agency workers are no longer able to decide whether reports warrant investigation based solely on information gathered over the phone. No shit, Sherlock. I mean, how on earth can you gather the right amount of information on the phone? You need to see the child is just so infuriating that we're in this era where we may not understand the ramifications of child abuse and we're going to put protective mechanisms in place and instead people are just willy-nilly making this, oh, I've got enough information, let's not move forward with that. It makes no sense. Also, no case is assigned a lower priority status until a caseworker meets a child who's allegedly been abused. That is a very good thing to do and to change because that means that they will have to be present and actually take the time to meet the child and figure out exactly what's been going on within their lives. The Child Welfare Reform Council that was commissioned by Governor Nathan Deal. Well, in January 2015, the council released this report. It had recommendations on ways to improve 
George's welfare system and that includes the creation of a child abuse register and additional training for all staff members, which is certainly a good move forward. Imani's grandmother, she took out a lawsuit. So she obviously feels that it could have all been a completely different story. Imani should have been safe living with her. So in 2018, she files a lawsuit in the Gwinnett County State Court against the GDFCS. She argued that caseworkers were aware of the deteriorating conditions and the abuse in the Moss family. And she stated that if the Department of Family and Children's Services had stepped up sooner, they could have saved Imani's life. Robin's attorney stated that Robin had indeed tried to get child services to actually open an investigation into allegations of abuse, but no action had been taken. Horrific. She knew. She tried to change the outcome of this awful case and they didn't listen. She's also suing the Department of Human Services and I understand that. At the end of the day, the only way you hit these is by making them pay out financially. It's wrong. It doesn't make up for the loss of life, but often it's what makes them sit up and listen when they're paying out large lawsuits. And what's also devastating for Robin is she opened her home to Imani and she wanted to keep her and she was denied that. And instead, that child was murdered because of it. Now, according to incident reports, child abuse involving Imani was dated back as far as 2004. And this is because in 2004, Emma Moss was actually charged and convicted of battery and child cruelty for beating Imani's birth mother in the child's presence. So she was witnessing abuse really early on, and that means that he wasn't safe to be around from the get-go. In 2005, Imani's school reported emotional and psychological neglect to the DCFS after Tiffany Moss allegedly hit her stepdaughter on the back of the head with a belt. And apparently Tiffany Moss's reason for this was because she was eating breakfast too slowly, which would make her late for the bus. The school nurse apparently gave her an ice pack for Imani's back, why was that child left with them? It's awful. So after the DCFS received this report, they did actually investigate. They opened the case. And the caseworker spoke to Imani, Tiffany Moss, and Imani's teacher. No concerns were noted. No. I she just chit with her. Belt on the back of the head. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Literally. Marked her on the back of the head. Nothing to see here. Needed an ice pack by the back of her head. Apparently she was late for the bus, so at the end of the day, there's nothing to see here, and I can understand why Tiffany Moss did that. That's literally how that played out, isn't it? This child was horribly abused in that moment, and still, nothing was done. And actually, it gets worse. The school's report was identified as insignificant and determined to be corporal punishment. Just a bit of corporal punishment. Um, is that... Beating a child with a belt, just a bit of corporal punishment. A little bit of the 1970s, you know? We like a bit of corporal punishment. No, most places made it illegal because it's just totally inappropriate and actually does very little to improve any behaviour. Just a bit of corporal punishment. I'm only saying a belt or a slipper. Just something that's not too hard, but hard enough. Honestly, I feel like I've gone back in time talking about the fact that the agency who's meant to care about what's happening to this child just found it insignificant and it's just a bit of corporal punishment. In 2008, the DCFS got a tip asking for them to look into claims of inadequate medical care and also possible sexual abuse. Caseworkers at this point met Imani in private and concluded that there were no concerns noted about her. This is a child who we know has actively spoken out, who slept in bushes to avoid the mother, stepmother, whatever you want to call her in this case, and yet when these workers are speaking to her, she's apparently saying nothing. I just think this demonstrates an absolute lack of care and professionalism. Also, four months prior to Imani's death, the DCFS receive an anonymous call that Imani is being neglected by her father and stepmother. The source also claimed she appeared to be thin, stated that Imani appeared distant and afraid to interact with others, quote. The DCFS closed the case after failing to find the parents' address. Failed to find the parents' address. And that's enough to close the case. 
I'm really sorry. We've got this we've got this repeated incidence of these individuals making allegations about this family. Yes, she was criminally convicted and put on probation for five years. And yeah, it's been a consistent theme and she lost her job because of child abuse. And yeah, there's been lots of suspicions about pretty horrific things happening. And yeah, we've got another one now saying that this kid is like really quite withdrawn, not interacting, is really thin. Who knows, might be starving to death and maybe we should do something about it. But you know what? I just can't find the address, so I'm just going to close the case. The distress I feel at considering all those people making an effort to protect this little girl and the DCFS doing nothing to actually protect her is utterly tragic and devastating to conceive of. People were trying to help. And all of those warnings were just ignored. Now, according to the lawsuit, as a result of the negligence of DCFS and its agents, Imani suffered constant abuse and deprivation from 2008 until ultimately her death. The lawsuit also states as a direct and proximate result of the defendant's wrongful conduct, the plaintiff is entitled to recover for the wrongful death of Imani, including the full value of the economic and non-economic value of her life had she lived. Robin herself explained that she helped to raise Imani from the time she was four years old and that the two had got this really strong bond and she said that since her granddaughter's death she cannot sleep because she can see her hurt. She said, I don't understand how the system kept putting her back in that home. Also, Imani's birth mother, Danita Leeks, she told journalists from WAGA TV that she and Eman Moss fought over custody for two to three years and that she was unaware that her daughter was being abused. She said, if I had known that him and his wife were abusing my baby, I would not have let her stay over there. Now, understandably, it's not as if she won Mother of the Year either, but I can completely understand that as far as she was concerned, when she turned over her parental rights, she thought she was doing that for a good reason and she felt that her child would be safe. And ultimately that decision contributed to this beautiful little girl's death and that must be a very difficult burden to shoulder. It is unbelievable how time and time again I cover cases where the failings in the systems that are meant to protect children are so enormous that it's stunning to some degree that these individuals ever manage to get into the positions of power where they get the chance to fail so miserably. It's shocking that Imani was killed in such a brutal, torturous fashion and that people were banging on the door of the protective services saying there is a problem and it just fell on deaf ears. And because of that, beautiful Imani Moss will not get to live a future she was so entitled to and deserved. It's so sad that Imani didn't get to stay with Robin. It's so bizarre to me that people like Imam fight to get custody back of their children when they are so unable to actually come up with the goods of being a decent parent. He should have allowed her to remain in the loving arms of Robin and keep her from the harrowing abuse of Tiffany Moss. But I wouldn't be covering this case if that had been how it had played out. I hope you feel I've done a good job hope you feel that I've covered it diligently. She deserves that. She deserves that. She absolutely does. And this video is 100% dedicated to Imani Moss, a beautiful little girl, someone who should have been cherished, someone who should have been able to continue their life fully loved and experience more fully lived. But that's not to be. Take care, guys. I need loads of love. Be safe.